All right, here we are back in the booth again for another uh, Rich Life Projects. And today, one of my uh, good friends and one of the uh, pioneers of MMA in Australia, plus just a good good dude, Nasty Noke, Kyle Noke. Welcome, my friend. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for bringing me down for this. Mate, no worries at all. It's always good to have you in the in the booth. What's been happening, my friend? Uh, not much besides making babies. I've got two kids now, three kids, but two under two. Um so I've been doing lots of that. COVID probably helped with that. But uh, besides that, just traveling around, doing commentating now for Eternal, uh, coaching some fighters, uh, tr- still trying to be a pro surfer, still no good at surfing. I think last time we went surfing, you surfed better than me, and I'm one trying to be real good. That's right. I, I believe I did. That was a merchy day, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, that was a good day. That was, you know, yeah. I enjoyed myself that day. That yeah, that's good. about it for me. And trying yeah. to stay fit always. All the time, all the yeah. time. I see, uh, yeah, making babies. But when you're a millionaire and you've retired from uh, <laughs> martial arts and now you're commentating, making the big millions, so I suppose, you know, making babies is the only thing to really do, isn't it? Sunshine Coast is growing, they say. Yeah, and I'm good at it too, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's understandable. That's understandable. So we go back to your childhood. Going back, you, you uh, were you born in Dubbo? Uh, born in Sydney, mum had cesarean for all us boys. She had a car accident when she was younger, broke a hip, so she had to have a cesarean. So we flew to Sydney. Mum had the babies. Oh, drove, see, flew. I don't know what they did back then. And back then, back uh, in the day, yeah, so I think horse drove. and carriage back to Dubbo. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, like, I was in Sydney for two weeks when I was born, come out of hospital straight back to Dubbo. So yeah, basically so what's, raised in Dubbo. What's the, uh, the Dubbo? You got the two brothers, three brothers? Three brothers. Three brothers. Yep. Uh, and growing up in Dubbo, the country town. What, what was the Cole Noakes sort of growing up in Dubbo like? Uh, it was wild. It was good. Um, you know, we spoke about this on the way here. I, I hate, I don't hate, I don't hate my mum, mum and dad don't hate you. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dirty at them for though, for like once we come up to Sunshine Coast, I'm like, why didn't you just bring me up to Sunshine Coast? Or why didn't you bring me to a coastal town to live? You knew about it, but you, you know, I'm still in Dubbo. But my life in Dubbo was good. Um, I played a lot of football growing up, obviously, um, you know, it was always doing something. Hated school. Was never in school, so I was always out in, out in the country, always doing something, swimming at the river, playing with my friends, getting into a lot of fights. Uh, we fought a lot in Dubbo because there was nothing else to do. And, and that's the country towns. I, I experienced it in Tamworth when I grew up in Tamworth as well. It's sort of when if you're not playing rugby league, yeah, in New South Wales country towns, then you're usually either at the pubs or you're out in the streets fighting. Yeah, and and that's exactly what it was like for us. Even playing football it was either we we're going to win the football game or we we're going to win the fight. So I got to a point where it was like, oh, we're not going to win this game. Blow it. And we had one guy, Marty, he was our hooker. We were like, blow it up, Marty. Maybe right out, we get in the next scrum and let him be lifting someone and it'd be all on. So we always walked away with a win. But um, yeah, even growing up in Dubbo, uh, we still fought nearly every weekend, basically. But it wasn't like we weren't out there being thugs and bashing each other and stuff like that. Sometimes it'd just be my mates calling up some other guys going, hey, what he's doing? He's want to have a fight? Like, yeah, all right. So we just go, you know, every, all, everything's all close. So yeah, we just ride our in. bikes over and all have a big fight. And then, you know, if once you hit the ground, everyone sort of pull you off and uh, not pull you off, but lift you up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, does that happen in the country towns back in the day? That's what happened to you, huh? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so those are the organized ones and uh, it was good fun growing up there. And that's probably where the uh, the fighting, sort of the the violence, so to speak, started for you. Uh, if it wasn't on the rugby league, it was <laughs> on the streets fighting in amongst the Dubbo crowd. Yeah, I guess oh, if you want to talk about the, the love of fighting for me and where it started, it's probably my brother Nelson. He used to sit me down and we'd watch Bruce Lee movies and Van Damme movies. And, and more so for me, it'd be Van Damme when I was young because he was kind of the thing when I was younger. But then straight after the, the vi- we watched the video, we'd be at the front kicking each other and punching <laughs> each other and trying all the moves we just saw and stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I guess for me that's where the love of fighting come from. Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. I suppose that's like every martial artist in our era, I suppose, and even the martial artists like young ones these days when they get introduced to Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris and the, and the Van Dams. At first, they probably go, "Who's that?" But then they watch and they go, "Damn!" But even even now, when you watch those movies, like when you revisit your past, because I've done it a couple of times, I'm like, "Far out!" I, what was I watching back then? Yeah. But then you you find it a bit funny when you watch them, and then you, the lip syncing, and then they still got great moves, but yeah, you know, you you realise the movie wasn't as good as what you thought it was, as in like acting and oh no, um. <laughs> 
the, the fight scenes were awesome. The acting yeah. was horrible. And uh, Van Damme's dancing in the movies was phenomenal. He's, he had those moves, you With know, he clapping, move. yeah, he danced on the dance floor and all the girls had come up. So I, I hit their moves on the dance floor now still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the retirement home. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, not, not I, really. I, I, the, the, old, the old birds, they know what it is. They, that's the Van Damme move. They come up to me, see? 100%. I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. So you go from you're in Dubbo, obviously growing up with the with the uh, the brothers. What, what year or how old were you when you actually moved? Because you went from Dubbo to Sunshine Coast, wasn't it? Yeah, when I was about sixteen, oh, probably fifteen or so. I'd moved out of home already when I was about fourteen years old. Lived by myself down the main street of Dubbo, across the road from a pub. Um, hated school, said that. So um, yeah, mum and dad knew I wasn't going to go to school, but had my own place above a shoe shop. And uh, me and my mates used to all come there, and it was my place, but it was a, a lounge room. No, I'm not really answering your question, but I'm going to tell you about no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> hey, this is what it's all about. There's there a lot of stories, brother. There was a lounge room, a bed, two bedrooms, and then you had to go down past the shoe shop out the back, and out the back, the building out the back where the kitchen, laundry, and bathroom was, was probably about 100 years old. Like, it was old. It was probably one of the first things down the main street at Dubbo. And we never used it. Basically, you'd, you'd jump in the shower as quick as you can and jump out before something bit you. <laughs> <laughs> you'd go in the kitchen, there'd be rats crawling across the thing. So, you know, it, I think it cost me 50 bucks a week, which I was about to afford when I was that age. But anyway, I moved, I lived there for a couple of years and I moved back home with mum. And then one of my best mates said he was moving up to the Gold Coast. So I said, mum, I'm going to go up to the Gold Coast if I've had enough of this. And she went, well, you can move up there with him or if you wait a couple more weeks, I'll move up there with you. Yeah. Just like if you come to the Sunshine okay. Coast with me. And I was like, yeah, fuck, I'll go to the Sunshine Coast with mum. I'll get food and look after her. And yeah. So and I, then you made you made the move with the whole – did the whole family go? Brothers and, and mum? No, me and mum originally first went up and then the, the rest of the family came up later on. But my intention was to go back to school when I got up there, which I didn't. You know, that was a good intention to go to school, but obviously I hated school. So once I got up there, it was, oh, no, I'll go to the beach instead and I'll swim and – Chase girls and so have one, fun. One, once you got to the Sunshine Coast and uh, obviously seen what sort of style of living it is on the coast, um, what was what what did you do for work? Like what was your if you didn't go to school, what was the the initial go to work? How how did you get get by? Obviously, you didn't have to have that much money because you're living with mum. But mm. uh, what was the the job sort of for Colin Oak when he first? When got it, to the Sunny Coast? Yeah, when I first moved up there, um, I didn't work for a little while, and then I. Decided to do a pre-apprenticeship plumbing course. So I went to TAFE for six months and then didn't finish that. Um, <laughs> dropped out of that early because I didn't like being there and then just lived on the coast for a bit longer. And then because I had no job and I had no work, I actually moved back to Dubbo for a little while. True. And then, yeah, so I went back to Dubbo. Who, back were, who to, was still living down there? Uh, I think Dad was still there at that point and yep. Nelson, my oldest brother. And after that, before that, my youngest brother, Denim and Adam, had both moved up the Sunshine Coast. Uh, my grandmother had moved up there. But I came back to work and then I went back to the abattoirs, hated that. Yeah. Done some Star, hated that, like install and pay TV. And then went up to Sydney to do some brickies labouring. So I helped labour for all the guys that were building the Olympic Village at the time. Oh, what was that for the uh, 2000 Olympics? Or? Yeah, 2000 Olympics. Yeah, really? Yeah, so I was a Bricky's labourer up oh, there. Oh, wow, yeah, right. I, how many years work? That would have been, you would have probably done a couple of years. Yeah, I did a bit of a year and a half and then um, obviously had enough of Bricky's labour and went back to Dubbo for a couple of weeks and then re you know, really had a wake up call. I was like, what, what am I doing back here? You know, this is dead end. There's nothing to do. I see all these friends doing the same thing I did when I left. I'm like, Fuck this! I'm going back to the coast to sort myself out. So it gets, it gets a bit like that, doesn't it? When you yeah. get to a stage in your life, and I mean, I'm me and my brother are like gypsies. We've moved fucking everywhere around Australia, basically. Well, on the east coast, but yeah, it's it's funny when you do have those little recollections, and you're like, all these crew are just here doing the same thing, and you feel like I can't do that. Yeah, I don't want to do that. No, that's right. So that's that's where obviously then the move back to the Sunshine Coast yep. Uh, happened. Yep, back to the sunny coast after that. I um. I was actually out motorbike riding the day before I was supposed to drive back to the Sunshine Coast. Went over a set of triples, first jump of the day, big crew sitting there. I was going to show off. I was going to be a real, that real cool guy. <laughs> went for a no-handed lander with my arm across my eye so I couldn't see and too far forward and ended up smashing my collarbone, smashing my hip. 
had to wait a couple more weeks till I healed up and then drove up to the coast. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. A couple, of, so a couple of weeks, well, you end up in hospital, obviously, because yeah. of that. Yep. And then a couple of weeks sort of started to recover and then you then you went back to Sunshine Coast. Yeah. So as soon as I was healthy enough to basically drive, I packed everything up, threw the broken motorbike in the back and went up to the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, right. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. So you get the, you get the Sunshine Coast and then you – Form sort of friendships with um, Higgins, Dan Higgins, Adrian Pang. They've got the uh, Brisbane Integrated. Mm-hmm. Um, was that around the the mark when you sort of started? To, how did you get into the martial arts side of things from from that? Yeah, I um, when I first moved up there, I started dating a girl who was oh, three or four years younger than me. She went to school with my little brother. Um, and I started dating her and she's like, I'll come down and meet my brother-in-law. So we went down to Caboolture to meet a guy called Tony Green. And oh, Tony Green. Yeah, yeah. He's, Tony. In, he's in Rockhampton or something. Where's uh, he now? Harvey Bay now. Harvey Bay. Yeah. He's a good dude. Oh, he's, he's awesome. Yeah, I've known him over the years as well. And yeah. he's uh, he's probably one of, he's, he's a true dude, isn't he? Oh, he is. He's, he's, he's really he's, humble, but he's a great, great dude that I've always encountered with him. Yeah. Yeah, right. Tony Green. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. And he was bodybuilding at the time. I think he, he was competing in NABBA for the worlds or something like that. And then I kind of shook his hand and said, g'day to him. He sort of shrugged me off and just another one of Jess's boyfriends. He didn't really care about me. And then um, a couple of weeks later, I saw him again. He's like, oh, do you want to come do some training with me? And I was like, yeah, I'll come do some training. Like I, I like lifting weights. Had and you done any um, wrestling or jujitsu or anything like that before? I'd done Taekwondo as a kid when I was about four, oh, 13, 12, 13 probably. And I got to about a year, whatever the first belt is, yellow belt. And then they wanted me to do some three point sparring where they'd walk backwards doing three strikes and forward three strikes. I'm like, this is like, fucking, like Carter. Yeah. And I was like, like this Carter. is useless. Oh. Like, this is not going to work. Yeah. I've done the same with Kyokushin. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'd do Carter. And I was like, no, I just want to fucking fight. Yeah. And all these are built. All right, let's just jump in and fight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, That's I'll what I that. wanted. And yeah. then um, dad's a big boxing fan. So we'd done a little bit of boxing with him. And obviously, my oldest brother, Nelson, watching all the movies, we'd be out the front. So doing my the kicks Bruce were really good. Yeah. <laughs> But Tony said to me, Tony Green's like, hey, come along to train and you'd probably be good. And I went, yeah, I'll be good. I'm, I'm strong. I can lift weights. Yeah. He's like, just bring a shirt and a pair of shorts that you, that you can train in. And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm going to lift fucking weights. Of course I'm going to wear some clothes. <laughs> That's what I was thinking to myself. I didn't yeah. say it to him. The man's a, he was, he was a monster. But um, anyway, he picks me up and we takes, takes me to, uh, what's that place called on Dewporth Avenue? Uh, across on that island. Oh, I don't know what the island's called. Anyway, it's up Sunshine Coast. You go across to the island over on Bradman Avenue. Like sorry. Minyama Island? Or? No, over no, on Bradman Avenue, Maruchador. Okay, yeah. I, I forget the name of it, but it's an island. Oh, and they have, yeah, it's got the little um, community hall there. Yeah, it was oh, a community that's, hall that's over right. there. That's right, that's a yeah. River. Yes. Yeah, I know it, yeah. Dewport Avenue, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I yeah. have. I've walked across there when I had the, the kids and we yes. went over there a couple of weekends. And t- yeah, yeah, it's right. Great. I didn't know it was there. Anyway, he dragged me across there and I'm thinking, fuck, we're going a long way to, to just to do weights. And we get to this community hall and there's all mats on the ground. And he's like, all right, run around and start warming up. And I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? I'm like, what is this? Anyway, as soon as it started, like, fuck, this is all right. I like this. And then we did a little bit of striking, a little bit of wrestling, a little bit of jiu-jitsu. And then at the end, we all uh, like wrestled each other to the ground and done jiu-jitsu. Mm. And I think I, even my first night, I think I submitted a, a guy that was a blue belt there. And um, yeah, the first night I was buzzing. I was hooked. I was like, oh, this is <laughs> what I love straight this. Straight black belt. Yeah. That's, that's cold, like, the nasty, no, oh, straight to black oh, belt. Absolutely. That, that's when I first fell in love with the sport. That first night, I was like, I was hooked from then. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then, so how did you, is that how you obviously met uh, Adrian and Dan Higgins at Integrated in Brisbane, sort of traveling from Sunshine Coast to Brisbane? Yeah. So- I'd been training with Tony and his brother, Michael Green, who used to fight in Pancrase back in the day. Uh, I'd been training with them for a little while, a month or so, and then Tony's like, hey, you're pretty good at this. Do you want to have a fight? And I was like, fuck yeah, I'd love to have a fight. So as I was, we started training for that, and we started driving down to Chris Haysman's down at um, Waco in Brisbane, and then going to Chris Haysman's, it was a two-hour drive every day. So we met Dan Higgins there. as this guy that'd come in laughing and talking and just absolutely smash everyone. And he lived in Redcliffe, so Tony's like, instead of driving to Redcliffe, I said driving to all the way to the other side of Brisbane, Brisbane. we'll drive to Redcliffe and train with Dan. So I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah. And then um, Tony had met Adrian and invited him, and we all just started hanging out and training together. And then 
Uh, obviously, had my first fight within a couple of months. I first started training and, and, and won that. But um, was that a pro fight or an amateur pro, fight? It was a pro fight. Um, was that so? You debuted like two thousand two. Two thousand two, yeah. And that was so you had. I was twenty two. Twenty two years of age, yeah, yeah. and you had your first pro fight. You've gone on that sort of a fight. You've done that for five years in in Australia, fighting for five years in Australia on a thirteen fight. Winning streak, oh, not winning streak, but thirteen fights, one loss, or something like I that. Have a clue yeah, I think I think yeah. it's like <laughs> I think I've I've seen some of that anyway somewhere. Uh, but people ask me now, like I, I don't even know what my record is. I don't know how many wins, how many losses. I just I think I think in Australia, if I, if I'm correct, it was 13, 13 uh, wins, mm -hmm. three losses, and one draw, right. or no contest, something to that one effect draw. in Australia. A draw. Uh, that a draw is draw against uh, Hector Lombard. Yeah, yeah. So he done five five years here, and Hector Lombard's no man no. to fight him. He's just like uh, I think James Dehuna mentioned him on the podcast yeah. as well, and he and as I said to James, looking across that that cage yeah. at Hector Lombard back in the day was like, oh, I've just yeah. signed my own death warrant. <laughs> yeah, and he was knocking everyone out. Everyone, back then too. Like he was I do remember people. those days. Yeah. He was hectic back yeah. in the day too. So I fought into a draw and. Um, yeah, everyone said that I won the fight. They'll throw on, it's, it's known as a controversial decision. Everyone yeah, thinks it's true. controversial because Hector may have won it, but yeah. So you start you start with the the MMA mm -hmm. and obviously getting in in good with the integrated crew who you sort of represented when you fought fought all the time. Yep. Um, you have your have your sort of MMA career going on. Where and how did you get introduced to Steve Irwin? Obviously, you were Steve one of Steve Irwin's bodyguards. Uh, I think Dan Higgins was his was his main bodyguard at that time. Yep. And you got you got employed or you got the job of um being his bodyguard as well. There's a lot of stories I can tell you that oh, that was some say, that I can't. Probably, probably can't. <laughs> but uh, uh no, nah, he was you know what he 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 had a zest for life like no one you've ever met and, and just being around him sort of brought that out in you as well. But um he, he was, I, I remember one day at work he came up to me, he's like, um Hey, do you surf? I'm like, nah. He's like, do you want to learn to surf? I'm like, yeah. He's like, right, meet me at the beach tomorrow morning at six o'clock or five o'clock, whatever it was. I'm like, all right, cool. So I meet him there, he gives me a wetsuit, gives me a board. He's like, meet me out there. So we go out and I'm just, I just smash all day long, pat, like cannot catch a wave. And he's, he was a good surfer. He was surfing and everything. And then he come out, do you like? I said, yeah, I fucking love it. He's right. And that was our job. After a while, it became our job was to meet him at the beach in the morning, surf with him, and then go back to the zoo and train with him. Yeah, and and yeah. essentially that's how I got the job. So Dan had been working with him for a few years already and Dan started out there as a janitor basically cleaning the toilets and stuff and then Dan, it's probably a story he could probably tell, but Dan, uh, Steve rode into the toilets on his motorbike and Dan was cleaning <laughs> after hours once. He goes, hey, I heard you're a fighter. And Dan's like, oh, yeah, you know, I do a bit. And he's like, I want to learn. And Dan's like, yeah, all right. He's like, do you want to be my security guard? And Dan's like, oh, I'm pretty happy cleaning your toilets, mate. You know, I don't really, you know. And, and Steve's like, no, no, fuck that. You're going to come work for me now and you're going to be my security guard. Wow. Yeah. So Dan ended up being his, he, the head of his personal security team at the zoo. And um, he was looking for someone else. Dan and him and Dan had started training already. And Steve wanted to bring someone else on to the security team who could do jiu-jitsu and train with him and beat him up and do all that. And at that time, I was looking for a job. So Dan asked me and I was like, yeah, I'd love to come out there and work. Mate, what a job! What a yeah. job to get. You know? So uh, I had an interview with Steve, and I remember sitting down with the HR department. And they're saying, "Oh, you're going to have to do this and that." And I'm like, "All right." And Steve walks in, and, and he's like, "G'day, Kyle. Nice to meet you." And, uh, and he's like, "Right, you got the job. Now let's talk about fighting." And we talked about fighting for an hour, and the HR <laughs> are sitting back, rolling their eyes, yeah. and waiting for probably, this to be over. Yeah. How, how Steve worked. <laughs> yeah, and then anyway, the HR lady, she's like, "Oh, I've told Kyle to be." wearing, you know, security clothes and that. And Steve's like, no, he's not. He's, he's on my personal security team and that's it. No one can fucking touch him and no one can do this. And and she's like, oh, okay, he'll be starting on this way. And she's like, no, he's not he's starting on this. And then that's it. Actually, you don't even need to be here and kicked them all out. And then we wow. talked about fighting for a bit longer and he showed me around the zoo and, and that was it. I, I started working for so him. So you work, you're working for him uh, in security yep. and, and obviously teaching him to do MMA or jiu-jitsu and wrestling, same as what Dan was. And yep. then obviously he's teaching you how to surf. Yeah, um, other things. But he's, yeah, have <laughs> other things. But his personal, his personal security and travel-wise, like you obviously spent a good part over in the US. What, what was the experience like when you're Steve Irwin's personal security? Because he was massive in the US. 
Yeah. He was mega. He was a mega star. Even to the mega stars, he was a mega star. Oh, yeah. He was a celebrity celebrity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty crazy to think of because when he was back at the Sunshine Coast and and when I was doing Sunshine Coast for 17 years, I had a lot of friends who knew him personally as well. Yeah. And he was just an ordinary dude yep. who would just be walking around in his car keys and, and doing whatever. But over there, he's, that, that experience would have been crazy. I, I didn't get to travel with him overseas. Um, Dan did a few times. Like I travelled down to Tasmania with him a few times. I travelled around Australia with him. When it comes to going overseas, you go to countries like America and then everyone's got guns. You, your personal security have to have guns. You know, I was 24 at the time, basically a kid, so they didn't want to – I'd have to sit for a gun course to carry a gun and all this. It was just easier for him to hire security over there. So whenever he went to America, he had his own, but we still travel with him a lot around Australia. Um yeah. On on sort of uh, expeditions, so yeah. to speak. Well, he used to take us up. We used to go up to North Queensland every year for about a month or two camping and, and uh, catching crocodiles, putting little satellite trackers on them and stuff like that. So he'd take me up there. I remember when the, the – when the, uh, Tasmania had that mine that collapsed, we went down there and I went down there with him. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, yeah right. So, Was that uh, when the two survivors got out? Yeah. Was that that so. mine? Yep. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So we went down there to see them guys. Went down there with him. So you jump on any crocs? Fuck heaps, really. <laughs> what's so, what's what's that like? Obviously, you got Steve Irwin who's the icon of croc catching, and yeah. and he's going, Kyle, jump on. Yeah. Like, what's that that thought when you're oh. th- sitting there going, I'm just about to jump on this <laughs> massive crocodile and I'm yeah. shit myself. You, you always felt safe because you know you knew he wouldn't put you in a position to be true, in danger. True. So you felt safe and you felt confident. Um, especially when the cameras are there because he's doing everything by the books and making sure everything's right. But as, as when we went, he'd come pick up me and Dan and, and Greg Jackson when he come that I'll oh, come over for a trip once. Um, he'd take us out to, to let the crocs out of the traps that we didn't need anymore. And that's when it'd just be us three jumping on the croc and there'd be no cameras or we wouldn't be wrapping the mouth up so the croc would be sitting there with its mouth open and you'd have to jump on it and push, the, push his mouth down, you know? Shit, that's scary. Yeah, that's, that's scary. when you'd be that's really like shooting yourself. Yeah. With fingers and arms here. <laughs> yeah. And but then, I suppose with Greg Jackson, because that's a that's a good thing that Greg sort of because he's a he's a, another great human. Yes. Uh, that uh, obviously you you introduced me to. So having Greg Jackson, Dan, yourself, and Steve Earl, and man, yeah. what a what a combination of that. Oh yeah, it was it was. Uh, it would have been some fun talk and fun yeah. trips on those. Yeah, especially Greg would be sitting on the crocodile holding his leg, going, you know, if you hold his leg like this and you do this and you <laughs> wait, counterweight your balance here, and if you move this way, you know, the croc can't do this, and we'd he, all be laughing a, at him. He's, and, he's got an incredible brain. Oh, phenomenal. Greg Jackson, hasn't yeah. he? For, just, for just for strategy, and, yeah. game planning, f- like a philosophy. Yeah, it's like a, a life philosophy. That dude. That's, oh, he's one. He's one of the. He want, yeah, he's one of the most intriguing and interesting humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'd love to have that dude on a, on a rich life. I'd probably have to have a four hour episode <laughs> to pick his brain. But yeah. yeah, that's that's a different thing altogether. But geez, yeah, yeah that would have been incredible having for those four. It, it, I think it was, man, and I think that was the one trip where I actually got bit by a croc. Really? Yeah. Where? Lightly bit on my oh, leg. Here we, here we go. <laughs> the, the, the battle stories are coming was, out now. I had to, we had to let one go. Have you ever it told was, that story? Which one? I've been bit by a crocodile <laughs> and just left it at that. <laughs> no. When they say, where did you get it? Oh, it just, it just, just nipped me. Just, it, it did just nip me. It, did it? it skinned me. Really? And, um, yeah, we, Steve, everyone, when we caught this, it was about, 17 foot crocodile, so it was fucking massive. And we were on a sandbank and it was facing down towards water. And, and Steve said, Everyone go and move your bags. And everyone moved their bags but two people. And Steve used to make me and Dan jump on the head all the time. So it was either me or him in the very, very front. And I'm on the very front covering this crocodile's eyes so I can't see. And Steve goes, Look behind you where the bags are. And I look behind him, That's where you're going to run. Everyone else is going to run into that tree. When I say, He says, Go. And the back half of the people go. Then he says, Now. And the people on the head go. He goes, go. They all ran to the, their, their spot. I look behind me, see the, these two bags that are sitting next to me. I'm like, yep, cool. That's the bag. So I run, instead of running backwards, I run crossways. And this, as soon as I take my hands off this crocodile's eyes, it turns around and snaps at me like that. And it just took all the skin off the front of my shin there. Wow. So it's, it's, its teeth just went chomp like that and just missed my leg and just skin the front of it. Skin the, oh. Yeah. Can you just imagine oh. if it got that leg? <laughs> Fuck, you wouldn't have got out of I'd there. I'd be gone. It, my leg would be gone anyway because they, they just – we used to give them um, a bull's head for Christmas and they just – you'd throw it in their pen and they just go – in one bite just flatten it like like to an inch <laughs> thick. <laughs> so it would have it torn my leg off. Wow. Yeah. 
And then, uh, oh, yeah, after that, the next, he made me jump on the very say, next croc. How did, you would have been in shock. I was. You would have been in shock after that. I was, I was white as a ghost. And then he made me jump on the very next croc about an hour later. And then I was, when we let go, he made me get on the head again. And then when I let go, I was the furthest one away, the quickest <laughs> one to get there. <laughs> and I was, I was still white oh, as. Oh, that's gold. Yeah. Fuck. Just tearing your shin off. Yep. And just turned around in one bite. Wow. If I and, and been a second slow, how he made gone. you jump back on another croc oh, yeah. an hour later, straight away, just to get that, because otherwise you would have been hesitant for the rest of yeah. your life, probably. Yeah, but that—that's how knowledgeable that dude is and oh, experienced yeah. around animals. Yeah, that's a crazy thing when you get yeah. you <laughs> nearly die or nearly yeah. get your leg amputated. Imagine you doing MMA with one leg. One leg, I'd do it. Wow, that's how would you kick? I'd do it still. <laughs> how would you kick? I just jump. Front kick to the face. Just got to yeah, jump yeah, first. Jump and dush. <laughs> wow, that's back. crazy. Yeah. Wow, that is a story. Man, imagine that. Just oh, I just <laughs> I can't even fathom it. So you you're on the on the trips and uh and I think you you what was the you done three years with Steve, obviously mm. some crazy stories there. Mm. What was the um what was probably the most valuable sort of thing that he he taught you? In regards to that, because if, if anyone's going to advise you about life or mm-hmm. advise you about things, you know, Steve Irwin's one one good character oh, yeah. to, to teach you in regards to that. Yeah. What what would, some, like the, as you say, he's got a, a zest for life. Yep. What sort of thing did you take from him that probably will live with you forever? The, th- the thing that I remember the most about him, like he, he was such a great person, right? The thing that I do remember the most about him was – the way he was a father, like the the love and the passion that he had for his kids. Um, you know, I love my dad to death, but he wasn't there for me much growing up, you know, and I'd really never had a father figure. Not that Steve was a father figure to me, but it, I never had someone like that. And just to see the way that he'd be in the middle of a meeting talking to the, the, the guys from um, the Discovery Channel in America or anything like that, and Bindi would walk in and go, Daddy, I need this, this, and this, and he'd be like, Look, guys, I've got to go. I've got to stop what I'm doing. My daughter really needs me right now. I'll come back later on. And he just dropped, no matter what he was doing, he, he if she really needed him at that moment, he, he'd drop everything for her. So yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good priority. Yeah. Get get your priorities right, yeah. isn't it? You asked me some stories. A couple keep popping into my head. Um, he used to. So we, he built us a cage at the zoo to train him. MMA cage. MMA cage. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. Decked it all out. We do MMA sparring on Wednesday morning. And uh, it was we'd start about seven o'clock, but he'd be up at two o'clock in the morning, have his hands wrapped already in the cage, shadow boxing, waiting for us to get there, just to, just to <laughs> get in love. That was his favorite day of all. Was Wednesday it was the MMA sparring, and then uh, he used to. We, if if Dan and I we weren't allowed to go away together at the same time because he wouldn't be able to get his training in, and he'd make everyone's life miserable at the zoo. And we did go away once to America together, Dan and I. And I remember the manager of the zoo, Frank, called us up at the time. He's like. When are you guys coming home? And we're like, oh, I think in another week or so. Why? He's like, you just need to come back right now. And we're like, why? He said, because he's had every one of the tiger handles in the zoo. He's heard them all. He's busted them all up. <laughs> <laughs> he's got all the elephant guy, like all the different zookeepers. He's brought them all into the cage and just <laughs> des- destroyed them all. Well, just yeah. trying to put all his technique yeah. into use. <laughs> now he's got no staff to do the zoo. Yeah. Wow, that's was, crazy. Yeah, he was. He loved it though. He at training, he's like, he says to Dan one day, he's like. I'm not really feeling these body shots. He's like, I don't respect them. He's like, if you find an opportunity to drop, you drop me. So I'd be moving around sparring and, and Dan hit him in the liver and he sort of, uh, he didn't feel it and then move around again and Dan uh, hit him again, dropped him and dropped him bad and he got up and went, all right, I know what they are now. I, res- I respect them, you know, but he yeah. wouldn't respect them until he felt them. Yeah, but that's, yeah, you can, you can see he's a, he would be a man like that. Oh, yeah. You know, because the same as when he's dealing with all creatures. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't feel that this crocodile, a bit of power, I need yeah. to feel their power so I can understand and respect them. Yep. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, you can definitely see that yeah. that uh, that whole philosophy on yeah. that too. So, same with it. Like when we first started teaching him, he was like, he said, well, what if I just swing wild at you? He said, I'll swing wild at you and you have your technique and come down the middle and we'll see how we go, we'll see who comes out better. I'm like, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> so he just comes at me swing and I'm sort of sitting back. I go, bump, bump. He drops to one knee and gets back up again, swinging wild again. I keep on waiting, just bump, another shot. Down he goes again. He goes, 
all right, fuck that swing a mile. Let's get back to learning how to do stuff. <laughs> Let's get back to hitting yeah. straight. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's that's a crazy story. That's yeah. a crazy story. Yeah. But that's the type of dude, yeah, type of dude you can just see even yeah. even that knowledge he, he would have for different things just yeah. to learn. And that's probably what made him such a great person. I suppose when you're doing martial arts or you're doing some specific job like he was, uh, to be open minded to learn all the time. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So you you're going through that those crazy stories with Steve and and having something personal with him that you would probably live you know with for the rest of your life yeah so and then you obviously you're in back in MMA mm-hmm. doing your fights uh, and I think you're overseas at this at this point because you went over there to uh, dabble in the US market and jump in there and have have fights but in two thousand and obviously uh, two thousand and six mm-hmm. I think it was when he passed. What what was that like? Obviously, it was a big moment for not only Australia but the world, losing such an icon. Mm. But where? What were you doing when you actually heard the news? I was I was in the states. I was supposed to fight in Las Vegas, um, but I just got I I got a fight call while I was up in North Queensland catching crocodiles with Steve. So I'd been with him two weeks prior, and we were supposed to be with him. But uh, I obviously got the fight call. He flew me home. We, f- Dan and I flew to America for the fight. And I think I flew there by myself. I don't think Dan come with me this time. Um, and I've been over there training for two weeks. And in that time, he left the croc trip and went down to film a documentary of underwater stuff. And I got a phone call uh, two weeks before the fight. I'd been out there for two weeks already. Two weeks, I, I took a short notice fight. Um, Greg Jackson actually called me and he said, i oh, you know, I've got some news for you that Steve passed. And I didn't believe him. So I'm like, bullshit, you know, yeah. I started laughing. I thought he was having a go at me. Yeah. And he's like, no, I'm serious. Like, you know, you need to make some calls or do what you need to do. And um, – Wow, that gives me that gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Because I remember, I remember I was at home in Maroochydore yeah. when when that day happened. Yeah. And it was, it was like a Lady Diana dying. Yeah. That, that type huge. of feeling. I was just like – no, that can't be fucking right. Same yeah. as even when Warney died here. Yeah. And it come up on the phones and you're like, Yeah. What's these dates? Warney, what? He yeah. hasn't died. Then the news starts coming and you're like, Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, that and but Steve Irwin was because he's such a loved character. Oh yeah. That was that was heartbreaking news. Yeah. And I spent all night on the computer just looking up trying to find out what happened because we didn't know what happened all no, the No one saying news. anything. Yeah. But um Yeah, I didn't get any sleep anyway. I uh, like everyone told me, like, oh, he'd want you to still fight, take the fight, and I thought, you know what, I'm I'm not going to fight. Another fight will come up. Um, I want to go home and say goodbye to this person who's been a big part of my life and, and pay my respects to him. So, um, yeah, I obviously cancelled the fight. Uh, flew home as soon as I could to be there, and I think I got there the morning of the funeral. The funeral. Yeah. Oh, really? So, um, yeah. Like I, I didn't want to miss that opportunity because he 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 funded all my. Tra- we went to America about five or six times. He funded them all. He paid for for us to go over there and train. He paid for Greg Jackson and a few of his guys like Keith Jardine, Nate Marquardt. He paid for all them guys to come to Australia oh, and tra- really? help, help us train for our fights here. And oh, true. Yeah, wow. So you know, I, I thought the best way for me would be go back, and pay my respects to him that way. Yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. Having, having such an impact, and he and he did. <laughs> I mean, you were right in there with him in the thick of things as he's one of his security guards and his surfing companion and his his training partner. So that that there, I mean, having such a personal impact in your life, mm. obviously things like being such a great father, you get to carry that. Yep. Even though you know, oh, this is what Steve taught me, but deep down, that's some of the things that you would take on and go. You know, just think that sometimes have little glimpses of Steve and his daughter, or yeah. even though Bindi and Robert are grown up now and taking the reins pretty well. It's yeah. man, they're doing so so well up there with the zoo and and everything. But yep. you would have those thoughts, obviously, being a dad now. Yeah, uh, a daughter, a son, or two daughters mm-hmm. and a son. Two daughters and a son. Finally. Oh, <laughs> finally, <laughs> they the old fella worked for you, right? Oh, no, hey? I'm done now. You, are, you... I've, I've had the snip now. I'm have done. you? Yes. Oh, yeah, three's enough. Hundred yes. percent. I thought two was enough. I had one of each, so I was just like, yep, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Get me out of here. My my middle girl's a maniac, so <laughs> I didn't want to roll that dice I'd, and get another one of her, so. Get it, get but, it out of here. Yeah. So then the so we're back to the MMA, and this is where probably uh, you and I cross paths at, at some stage as well, where um, you got into the US in regards to you're on the tough 
uh, Ultimate Fighter Championship. Yep. How, did, how did that opportunity come about? I had um, Steve Dine was a big thing for me as well. I um, he, he, because of how passionate he was, and like I said, he brought passion out of people. I, it really made me stop and go, well, what do I want to do with my life? You know, do I want to stay here? Um, I, I was still working at the zoo for a year after he'd passed, and and uh, you know, just just to be there for Terry and the family. And but it, it come to a point where I, I felt this burning desire that I had to go to America and chase my dream, what I was passionate about. So for me, it was like, oh, you know, I had to make that decision. So I had a girlfriend at the time. I, I sold everything that I owned. I did everything I could to get to America to pursue my dream. And um, I had no promises when I first got there. I had no one lined anything up. I just I was lucky enough to uh, be good friends already with a, at that time with Joey V Senior and Holly Home yeah. who, who let me come stay at their house but um yeah I sold everything I had I had a house at the time with my girlfriend so she bought me out I went over to America uh at the I got line I got a fight lined up in Puerto Rico went and fought in Puerto Rico really yeah that's cool yeah it was awesome it was, yeah. it was a it was in Puerto Rico and it was so humid and, and they had like a big stage and we had to sort of they had like a mechanical thing that pushed us up in the middle of the stage, but we had to sort of squat for the first half and then stand up slowly, then the machine would take over, make it look <laughs> like we were coming up the whole time. And then we went into the cage and I fought a guy called Casey who Husco- Casey Uscola ended up being on the Ultimate Fighter with us as well. But the cage was that slippery. I remember one point I push kicked him from my side of the cage. He fell on his back, slid all the way across to the <laughs> other side of the cage. I ran over to do a big punch on him and my foot slipped and I landed on the ground and we both sort of <laughs> ended up tossing around like a like a jelly wrestler. Oh, the old jelly wrestler <laughs> in Puerto Rico. Yeah. But anyway, I, I won that wow. fight, went back to Albuquerque again and uh, at that time my manager had called me and said, hey, there's going to be an ultimate fighter thing and um, – you don't have to go to the tryouts. They they pretty much want you. So if you go to Vegas and interview with them and and they like your interview, um, yeah, you'll get on. So I went to Vegas, interviewed, um, you know, sp- lied basically through my interview. I wasn't a big drinker. I actually quit drinking for a long time. And they're like, oh, you're Australian. Do you drink? I'm like, yeah, of course I drink. You know, we're born with a bottle in our mouths. We're all drink. <laughs> I don't know what they wanted. They wanted the drama on the show oh, and all that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I went in there and, and like, it was, I was only in the interview for about two or three minutes and the guy who runs the big the big head on show, he's like, all right, Kyle, get the fuck out of here. And I was like, oh, what's that? And, and I walked out and the guy's like, no, nah, it means he likes you. you you'll get, oh, you you'll got get in. Up. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here, Cole. Yeah. You didn't get in. Oh, no. no. I thought, I thought, oh, fuck, I, I must have been for sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, like, nah, that's, how you, you, that's how you got in. So you got yeah. into, because that was uh, Team Liddell and who was it? Ortiz. Ortiz, that's right. Tito Ortiz. Tito yeah. Ortiz. And you're on uh, Team Liddell? Team Liddell. Team Liddell. So that experience would have been, uh, you know, coming from Australia and then now you're in the US and now you're on the Ultimate Fighter, which obviously all MMA guys and girls want to try and achieve to get to. Mm-hmm. Uh, some think it's they've made it yep. and some believe, <laughs> right, now I'm, now I'm in the big league, it's it's time to to really work and, and follow me passion. Yeah. That experience would have been a pretty crazy experience. It was. Uh, it was something I wasn't used to, but um – like just being around all these guys, they're all fighting and try to be friends with each other. And Cause you had to live the in the same, same house, didn't you? Yeah, it was, it was insane for me. Um, and I'm not a good sleeper too. And I'm sleeping in a room in a single bed next to a guy next to a single bed next to me. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love the show. Like, um, I love being on there. Uh, I love Chuck and his whole coaching team were phenomenal. You know, Chuck's, he's, he's hilarious. But, um, I remember, I'd won my fight to get back then. We had to fight to get in the house. Uh, I'd won that fight. I fought the biggest, baddest dude there, and and he's, he was a really good kickboxer, and he's a kickboxer again now. But um, I just took him down and elbowed the the crap out of him. And his blood was the bloodiest fight they've had on there. Wow. I remember picking blood out of my ears for three days later. No way. But I won that fight, and then I submitted the next biggest guy in there. I was only a small middleweight at that time. I sub- submitted the next biggest guy in there in the first round, and then um. Uh, John Hackleman actually he was Chuck's head coach pulled me aside and he's like what are you even doing in the ultimate fight he said you should have went straight to the UFC you know he looked at my record he brought up he said you fucking you beat Hector Lombard you've done this you fought this guy this guy and I was like oh no one offered me so I just come in here and then after that point they kind of neglected me a little bit they kind of like didn't worry about me as much they thought oh Kyle he's, he, he'll take care yeah, of himself he's, he's got he, it in he'll the get in the Uf- yeah, UFC he's anyway beat this guy already he's beat that guy he's gonna smash everyone and, and uh, so I had another fight lined up against one of my old teammates, one of my actual current teammates at Jackson's, and um, 
I still remember, I usually don't sleep before a fight, but I'm laying on the couch waiting to fight and I fell asleep and then I woke up and look at my watch and it's like 10 minutes before the fight's supposed to start and Chuck wasn't there yet and the team weren't there yet and yeah. they rock in about seven minutes to go before the fight. My hands aren't wrapped or anything and and for me, I love to have a burnout backstage. Like, like I empty the gas tank backstage, come out and have yeah, my second yeah, win yeah. in the it's fight. Just, yeah. That's interesting because some, some people don't. Some people like to just get a bit of a sweat. Yeah. Move around, feel a bit warm, yeah. then sit down and relax, yeah. get up and do a little bit more. Because, yeah, sometimes you do, you do see, or I've seen people at the back and they're warming up and it's like they're doing 10 rounds already yeah. and they're already gassed and you're thinking, now this dude's <laughs> got to go out there and do it and fight five, you yeah. know, three five-minute rounds or something. Yeah. No, I like so to do one, one big round out. I'm not 10 rounds. I'll, no, do, not ten, <laughs> <yeah>. I'll <laughs> empty the tank, no, as, the tank as, over, as hard and as fast overkill. as I can. Yeah, right. Until I get to the point where I'm like <gasps> – I'm fucked, you know, and then I'll start to breathe and then I'll come good. Otherwise, I, I had that in the cage. I had that out there where I'm like, oh, I'm gassed. I'm starting to get tired, you oh, know. Like I have all that. I go through, and- yeah, I go through those emotions out there in the cage instead. So when I have them backstage and then I'll, I'll blow out, then I'll sit down and rest for a minute, then I'll get up and then I'll go light on the pads and then yeah, I'll, right. oh, yeah, this is like, I know what I'm doing now. I feel this and then, then I fight better in the cage. So in that fight that I lost, like everyone in my show lost on the show. Did they? Even the two winners on the, uh, the winner oh, on the Ultimate Fighter show. the finale. The finale, he'd oh, lost wow. on the show. Every, everyone lost. So that was my fight when I lost. As, as, and I don't know, there's always excuses. Like, I'm not trying to make an excuse, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get a warm up for that fight that I lost on the show. Yeah. And, and that's my excuse. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Especially if you are a person who's right. I like to, you know, yeah. to blow the gas, the yep. gas tank apart before I go out there. Yeah. That would have, yeah, probably would have played on your mind as yeah. well. So, yeah, I went out there and I fought all right, but I just, I was tired. I was just. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Right. Yeah. No good. So, yeah. obviously, then you, you stayed in. You stayed in the US and lived mm-hmm. there. Yep. Most people, obviously, if they get in the USC, a lot of them, uh, if they're in the UFC these days, they fight over in America. Then they'll travel back home to Australia mm-hmm. and then they'll fly back. What What was What was your Why was it your choice to stay in America? Obviously, in Albuquerque at Jackson's, you've already met Greg Jackson through Steve and a few other friends. Uh, was that because of the reputation Greg and and Wickle John had as coaches? Uh, you decided to live in Albuquerque. Yeah, it it, it was it was it was Greg and Winkle John. It was a team that was there. All the guys that were there, um, I'd formed some awesome friendships, and I and I, I really liked the lifestyle over there. Um, and it was just about being, especially back then. Jackson's was the best spot in the world. I was going to say the old Jackson gym. Yeah, uh, and I, I was lucky and privileged enough. Obviously, you opened those doors for me to go and travel over to Jackson's. Yeah, but then you know those are the things where. Someone like me walks in the door. You got yourself, Overeem, Travis Brown, John Jones. Oh man, there's just there's just names and names yeah. and names. Rashad Evans, Saint Pierre. There's so many names that trained at the old Jackson. Yeah, a uh, coma, I think it was. Yep. Um, yeah, that, and that's probably understandable why you're thinking I'm at the best place in the world right at this minute. Yeah, to stay there and train. Yeah, and then it was also it was fun outside of training too. It, I was like, if I go back home, all my friends are at work during the daytime. I'm sort of doing everything by myself. If I'm over there, we go on go kart racing. You know, we got fucking cowboy ring us up trying to take us out doing all kinds of crazy shit Man, like bungee jumping. Cowboy, cow- <laughs> cowboy back in the day, he was yeah, he had his ranch. He was a crazy dude, and oh, I, we got the, I got the privilege to hang out for a month or so with you at, living at Cowboy's Ranch. There, that was yep. that was through winter too. Yep. And the old heater in the old heater in the gym starting up. That was a, I thought that was crazy. Uh, I'm in my track suits and have my thongs on, and it's minus thirteen degrees or something. Yeah, but they, you know those times with Cowboy yourself and and Bones and all those sort of crew at that time. That was man, that was like me living a dream at yeah. that at that time. But I can understand why, you know, especially that environment when you go. Well, I'm at this that world. Yeah, at the top of me top of my game and it's world class level, yep. you gotta train with the world class athletes, do yeah. you? Yeah. And and I I really got I really respected Greg Jackson a lot too. Like I really got off on his strategic mind, you know, I'd love to talk to him about everything. Like, you go into his office and he's got 
uh, John Shackleton maybe. It's, it's like an old explorer back in the day who led his crew through a fucking Antarctica or something to keep them alive. And he's got all these guys from history all over his walls, you know, and I, I was fascinated with who they were and what they did and why he, Greg likes them. And, and you know, like, so I'm not a smart man, but I like to be around smart people. So I'm hey, like- Hey, that's the saying, yeah, isn't it? That's I know. The so I'm trying, like, trying to, to be successful. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn everything I can off him and, you know, everything I can off everyone else around there. So- when you when you do see uh, someone like that, and as I've as I've said uh, with Jack Greg Jackson, I didn't see too much of his office at that stage. But when someone is into history, mm. and obviously he's he's teaching MMA wrestling violence, so to speak, but he's he's looked at all the past. Genghis Khan, he's as you say the names there from uh, old history people. Yeah, you know that's how he gets his. Plans, yeah. you know, and then when you think about it, like how he read about their plans of yeah. uh, fighting or traveling or whatever, he took that into the modern day. Mm. That's how I seen Greg when I was always there. Is going, this dude goes back in the past yep. and gets all the methods that worked back then and brings them into the modern day and see if they work in the modern day yeah. of, of MMA. Yeah, and and he was he was a master at it. He was brilliant, you know. Um, I guess he, he was kind of saying he he lead he's trying to lead a, a group of guys um that kind of want to quit. Everyone wants to quit. Oh. Like he, he used to take us on the Hill of Tears, like who's called the Hill of Tears, everyone breaks down on there and cries. So everywhere you go, people are trying to like you're not gonna quit, but you wanna quit inside. And it's his job to make you tougher, make you stronger, and you'd be sprinting up this fucking big desert hill and the sun's blaring down or it's freezing cold and there's ice and he's at the top, you're yelling at you, you know, like, look around, there's nothing, nothing weak grows here. You want to be fucking tough. If, if you feel like you're going to die, keep going, like seek death. Yeah. Like what a fucking glorious yeah. way to die. And you, you just give you that extra yeah, thing. When you when, when, especially when he's saying it, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, Greg yeah. Jackson's telling me that. Yeah. And so he was, he was a leader, you know, like he was a, yeah, he was a real leader and, and, and that, that's probably why I respected him so much and, and willing to follow him into any battle anywhere and, and, Especially back in the day before, even before Diego Sanchez and Keith Jardine got in the UFC, Greg's, he had a tight knit group and he was like a fucking leader. Like he, those guys would do anything for him. He pretty, pretty much like a, like a, the old Star Wars Yoda. Yes. You know? Yeah. The Yoda. That's, that's what it, it yeah. flashes that vision when I talk about or see Greg Jackson and, and catch up with him. Yep. It's like, it's like I'm talking to a Yoda. It's like yeah. the dude's, Present in body, but his mind is is everywhere. Yep, it's, it's a he's a crazy. Uh, it's a crazy thing when you meet humans like that. Yeah, but that's that's always always just Yoda. It just comes to mind every time <laughs> I look at him. But I think there was because there was a. Um, I think when I started traveling over uh, and training with you and and the crew, I think there was like the proving grounds or something that Greg and the crew done like a. Uh, a video or a, a documentary of Proving Grounds. I think that had a lot of uh, – were you there at that stage for yeah, that? I was there for some of that. I didn't – I must have overlooked your head. <laughs> <laughs> I was a but quiet that, one, grinding away in the background. Yeah, but that, that, that was a good insight to that philosophy when I looked at Greg and said, he's like Yoda, everyone just follows him because he's got that much knowledge. Yeah of what he does. And then been able to apply it, like you said, and apply it in the modern era. Yeah. And, and apply it to his teaching and, he, and he'd reference some of the stuff in his teaching and stuff like that as well. But he's, he's, he's very well known all over, all over the world, but these days he doesn't do a lot, a lot of MMA coaching mm. because he does a lot with the police force and the mm. army and everything else, like yep. um, tactical training and all that, I believe. He does a lot of, um, uh, he, he does, he helps a lot of people in a lot of different things. Um, he's big into his tactical shooting stuff. And I guess that's probably his new avenue for him is, is trying to, because once he, once he does something, he has to work at every little fucking aspect about it. So for him, it's a tactical shooting. He's he got now. a bit of, bit of St. Pierre about him. Yeah. Because Pierre, like if he got beaten at something, he'd have to go away and train it until he perfected it. Yeah. Well, at least got good at it. Yeah. And that, that's the traits I always think, like Greg with his and, and Pierre, St. Pierre with that, I'm like, is that those traits that make those people just great. Yeah. You know? St. Pierre was a wild man too. Yeah, yeah. He'd go I, out drinking all night with him and then- Yeah, well, Wayne, Wayne Parr, like when I was traveling to the US with Wayne Parr and he'd be like, 
you know, he tra- he was travelling on the planes with him yeah. and he used to have like girls in every port yeah. <laughs> and he used to be frantic if he couldn't get get one of them. He'd go to train them but yeah. then he'd go missing. Yeah. And he'd have like the girls in the rooms and yeah. everywhere he flew and he goes, that dude was just crazy, yeah. like just an, an addiction. Yeah. And I and, thought, and, wow, that's crazy. And, and go out and drink all night and train just as hard the next day as anyone else. Really? Yeah, he'd just make everyone drink water before they he's – like, he'd, he'd take you out, dr- drinks all night and then – Order like fucking 10 drinks, 10 bottles of water for everyone, and you had to drink them before you went home. Yeah, You're right. Like, Come on, we're going to train tomorrow. We're going to train. And everyone's like, I'm fucking hammered. I'm not training tomorrow. And they're like, no, nah, you got to train. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, some of the, some of the, some of the stories I've heard about yeah. Saint Pierre <laughs> from good, good sources. Yeah. Uh, I just think, wow, that's, you know, he's at the top of his game and, and a legend. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, just to be able to back up and, and keep going. Yeah. So you're in the UFC, you're fighting, uh, you debuted on the finale, mm-hmm. the the finale. Mm-hmm. Then your career, obviously 2010, 2011, you started your career and living in, in the US. Injuries was a big thing mm-hmm. for you. And Fuck yeah. personally, personally, I believe if, if you weren't <laughs> injured as much yep. as you were, yep. um, I believe you, you could have even went further than you did. Yeah. Um, that's just from obviously knowing you for a lot of years and and seeing you on the sideline with injuries and that they yeah. and some of the injuries that you you occurred what what were some of those obviously um, the whole body <laughs> oh yeah the whole body in the end but every time I get momentum built and and I'd and I'd be like feeling really good and, and I know I know myself like where I could have been from the guys that were in Jacksons who I trained with and the guys that won titles and and stuff and the guys I used to beat up in the gym. Like, so I, I know, I knew where I was. The worst thing for me was my injuries. Um, one of the biggest ones was when I blew my knee out. Um, I was pushing a guy against the wall and I was about to kick him and I thought, I won't kick him because he's standing against the wall. And I was supposed to fight Akiyama in Japan at this point. And I held back on the kick. He caught it and I thought, oh, he'll just let it go because he knew I didn't kick him hard and I turned to walk away and my foot's planted so I turn around 180 and then he just absolutely belts my knee and just tore everything on the inside of my wow. right knee. So I tore my patella tendon off. My knee was sticking out the other side. I had to straighten it on the ground. Man, you but, would have been fuming. Yeah, oh, it was wild. Fuming. But, um, yeah, that was an injury. I would uh, I was training with Jake Shields once, and um, he rolled over the top of my hand and tore all the ligaments in my wrist. So my wrist was all uh, bandaged up. I had rods in it and all that for like four months. And then after it come off, it, it still doesn't straighten now. So I can't bend my wrist. First fight for, back from that, I, I snapped this knuckle in half because I never punched on it the whole time. So when I fought Patrick Cote, it was probably the first time I threw a decent right hand and snapped my knuckle in half. Um, shoulder injuries, I, I tore my shoulder. Both shoulders, actually, both surgery, surgery on both shoulders. And how's it, and at present, how's, how's now you're obviously <laughs> retired from fighting. Yep. How's the body actually hold up? Obviously, because you still train regularly each day. So yeah. obviously, that's sort of like a bit of a remedy to go, you got to keep training. Yeah, to I keep. have to, I have to lift every day, not lift every day. I have to train weights at least three or four times a week, a, a day, a, a, a week, just so my body does hold up. I notice if I don't lift weights, that, all these little niggling injuries come back. So I've, I've figured out now if I keep the weights up, it must work all the little muscles Makes around there or something. Yeah. yeah, everything just feels stronger and better. Yeah. Um, having time off, I don't grind as much as I used to. You know, I'm not doing as much MMA-style training and stuff. But now when I do spar and when I do get in there, I, I don't spar much anymore. But when I do, I feel good. Yeah, true. Like I move better. I'm moving around. I see stuff better. Um, yeah, I do jiu-jitsu a lot still. I still do that three or four times a week. But – um. I don't spar anymore. I don't hit mitts. I've actually want to start hitting mitts again. Yeah. But like I said, I, I jumped in with John Fraser, the middleweight champ in Eternal, and, and I feel like I haven't missed the beat. You know, I'm moving around. I'm moving well. I'm hitting him when I want to hit him. I'm getting out of the way most of the time from him. I mean, and he's the Eternal champ. John, yeah. John Fraser, you're gone, brother. Yeah, you're gone, bro. I'm coming for you. <laughs> hey, he's a good man. I, I hope you're not he's listening, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I hope he's not listening. <laughs> no. So all well, the dealing with the injuries and then you're obviously – uh, with your career, 2011, 2012, 2013, uh, 2014, it carries on. When you obviously then you get 
the opportunity to coach the the nations, the ultimate fighter nations, and you yeah. get a team of Aussies come across to fight the Canadians. Yeah. That experience, being up in, in Canada, yep. that would have been a crazy experience because oh. you had some, obviously, the Dan Kelly, the Jake Matthews. Uh, I think you had Tyler back in the day. Yep. No one really knows of Tyler these days, yeah. but what, what a talent. I was only talking oh. to Dan Kelly about him. Phenomenal. What a talent he was yeah. and probably what a talent wasted. He still is. He goes, drops in the gyms every now and then these days and hasn't missed a beat. He beats everyone up. He fucking has a laugh, goes and gets on the drink afterwards and he goes missing again for a couple of months. I wonder what, yeah, hey, just people Phenomenal. like that, eh? Hey? It's yeah. just, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. So you're, you're in the ultimate fight of nations and, yep. and uh, fighting there. The Canadian, obviously up in Canada, it's freezing cold. Mm. Uh, Adrian Pang and mm. uh, who else was coaching? So, uh, Izzy. Izzy. Izzy, Izzy, Izzy a great Izzy man. Martinez yeah. is the wrestling coach. Yeah. Uh, Alberto Alan Carr, Tusa as the jiu jitsu coach, yep. and Adrian as their striking coach. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, it was phenomenal. Would have been, there. would have been a great experience. That. Yeah, we used to. That, that was a fun time in my life because I just not long had surgery on my wrist, so I couldn't spar myself really. Um, yeah, so training wasn't a high priority for me, but I, I was. We were there every day for the guys, like just because my training wasn't a priority doesn't mean I wasn't there for them. But I remember we used to roll the fattest joints on the way to train <laughs> as thick as my thumb. <laughs> Here's his wild man. And oh, he, that'd man. be full of hash, you know. And oh. then Adrian would be sitting in the back with his shirt over because he doesn't smoke. He's like, guys, <laughs> please just wind the window down. I just got to breathe. Uh, yeah. Is he, man? So, he's he's yeah. one crazy dude. Yeah. I think he's a lot tamer these days, yeah. but back in the Albuquerque days, he oh, was one crazy. Wild man. And we ended up, so we do, do that twice a day. We drive 40 minutes through these blizzards to get to the drink gym. And then we didn't stay in the area where everyone else did. We had our own little cabin. It was a little cabin on the bottom of a ski mountain. So oh, we'd come nice. back, we'd go get all the ski gear, and the slopes were open to like one or two in the morning. So we'd just wow, really? snowboard all day. We'd Is ski. that because of the sun or did they have the no, lights just, on or something? Yeah, big lights on. Yeah, right. So we'd just snowboard down the mountain all night, get on the ski lift, go back up, have a little smoke on the way up, ski back down again <laughs> all the way. And if we weren't doing that, we are going out partying and drinking and oh. having a good time. But I say all that. But our main priority, or obviously, was the fighters. We yeah, were there yeah, for them. True that. Up, you know, that was that was our main priority. I don't want to make it sound like it was a party <laughs> thing for us. <laughs> that but, was a, but it that was. was a benefit. Yeah, it was a benefit. Yeah, but yeah. um, that would have been a great experience. But. Yeah, meeting guys like Jake Matthews, Dan yeah. Kelly, uh, Richard Walsh. Yeah, f- just all phenomenal guys. Like guys, I still talk to now. I'm still yeah. friends with now. Yeah, and no, I'm so no, glad no, I got to meet some, them. Yeah, great dudes that come out of that. Yeah, that sort of uh, Brandon that tough O'Reilly. Nation. Yeah. yeah. There's some great dudes. And- you know, the Brandon O'Reilly, he does not get enough credit. He fought the first fight in the show, lost his fight. He was still the first guy warming up at training, the first guy with all his gear on. He was motivating everyone. The whole, never once throughout that whole camp, that whole show, did he look down and say, ah, oh, fucking poor me, you know. He was just, every time anyone needed him, he was there. Every time someone wanted to spar, he was the one sparring with them. And you've got to, you've got to have those dudes oh, in your team, don't you? Oh, absolutely. Especially when you guys are out in the slopes partying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to, oh, I better get, hey, Brendan, can you take care of him yeah. at, at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, but you do need that that energy around too, oh, especially yeah. if you, you're winning in some, you're losing some, you need someone to be just yep. picking you up all the time yep. as well. So a big shout out to Brendan. That's, that's <laughs> He's a great dude, great oh, dude. awesome guy. So he had that experience. You're going through the the 2014 right up to 2016. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had a couple of losses and then 2016 you got to stage. I think you were fighting in Australia, mm-hmm. Melbourne? Mm-hmm. Melbourne, I think. So that obviously fight didn't go to plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not quite sure what the plan was. Uh, the plan was to go in there and get paid at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I said, the body was you, hurt and everything. Yeah, you know, was was, you, were you really feeling it, like just losing love? Yeah, lose uh, of the sport at that stage. Yeah, and and it, it's kind of a cash twenty two. You know, they they really increased my pay at that point as well. So yeah, true. It was so like it, was, like, it oh, started becoming about the money. No and motivation, the, yeah. but they're paying me more. Yeah, so I was like, fuck. And, and then, uh, yeah, I knew first round. I was like, oh, fuck, this is my last fight. I'm done. And then once you start thinking like that, you know, it's, it's, there's no coming back from that. You can't fight when you're nah. fucking thinking about quitting. So nah. not that I was thinking about quitting, but no, no, about no. Retiring. But then just that whole hunger's gone and yeah. everything else. But so after that fight, uh, you lose on, on decision mm-hmm. and then you basically say, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're retiring from the sport. Uh, you, you were still, were well, you in, America still at that stage. Yeah. And then you're moving back. Yep. And move back Straight to the Sunshine Coast. Fight, yeah. 
So okay. once you finished, I think it was one or two years after you finished. Yeah. And then you made an announcement again yeah. that you're coming back. Yeah. Uh, to fight. What was what was the was it because you just couldn't let go <laughs> to finish how you finished? That was a main plus. Obviously, there might be a chance I could still make some coin. <laughs> Yeah, what, no. what was the real reason for that? Because I, I remember uh, at some stage you were announcing you're yeah. coming back, and yeah. and I think I was even talking to you personally, going, "Oh, you're gonna man, you're gonna come back." I think it was 2018 or or yeah. I mean, 17. Yeah. The, the for me, the body felt good, the time off felt good, you know, and, and a lot of things that didn't happen. A lot of things happened. I, I realized when I came back to the Sunshine Coast, I realized I was homesick the whole, like the, for the last few years I was living in America and, and didn't realize it. You know, I'm driving down the main street of Sunshine Coast. I'm like, fuck, this is what I've been missing the whole time, you know, and it really sort of fired me up again. And then the time off, not grinding so much, uh, my body felt good and I felt like I could move again. So everything was clicking for me and everything felt good. And then, um, yes, I said I was going to come out of retirement and just never eventuated, never got that fight. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Which is a sad thing, but anyway. Yeah. You move I've still on. got one left in me, Richard. One left I've still in got one left in fight. me. Boxing I'll have fight? a boxer fight. I'm, I'm keen fight? as. Yeah. Put me in there. Oh, well, I'll have to. I'll, Give me one of those big hey, footballers. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be throwing <laughs> your name in there. Don't worry Give me about one of those big footballer bums that just oh, get in there and lay on someone. I reckon, uh, what's the Queenslander who, who fought Gallon? What's his name? Hodges. Hodges. Yeah, I should know been a Queenslander yeah. sport. <laughs> But yeah, Hodges and uh, Noak and Hodges. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Easy money for Noak. I'll, I'll wipe the floor with him. Woo-hoo. There you Guaranteed go. Guaranteed knockout. <laughs> <laughs> so you finish all your martial arts now. Obviously, you you're with your girl. You've got, as I say, the two two daughters and the son. Mm-hmm. Um, what's what's work wise? What's work wise look like for Noak now? Like um, I remember you were in um, some. Property development with your mum? Yep. Or buying houses, doing them up, selling and whatever? Yeah. He's still doing that or what? Uh, no, I put the brakes on that for a little yep. while. Um, yeah, prices went crazy over COVID, so we were lucky enough to capitalise right when the the market started, so I'll wait till it comes back down again and I will dabble back in that. But um, I was trying to be a pro surfer, Richard. 100%. That's what I want to do. Well, I'm that, that worst, leads me to the next surfer. question. So- Young girls or guys coming up in the sport or in life, uh-huh. uh, what, what's the best advice you've got received and what would you give to them in regards to if they asked, oh, you know, you being you now and the experiences you've had, mm-hmm. what's the best advice you would give to the young guy or girl sort of uh, or sportsman mm-hmm. coming into the, the sports or just dealing with life? Um, you got to make sure you're passionate about it. you got to make sure that, it's really what you want to do, you know, not something you like, oh, I kind of want to do, you know, you, you've got to make it your life. Um, it's got to be everything to you. You've got to put all your eggs in one basket, basically. I know it's bad to say, but you have to do that. You, and, and shit, if I'm going to give some young guy advice, fucking don't drink. Don't do drugs. Like you've got a short opportunity to make the most you can out of life. Like don't waste it going out and partying and celebrating and, you know, like give your, your brain the best opportunity, give your body the best opportunity. How bad do you really want it? Like, is it, is it worth sacrificing the, the late nights, the partying? Is it, is, it, is, it, is your dream worth that much? Then fucking throw it all away. Don't drink. Don't like, I'm trying to convince my nephew now he wants to be a pro footballer. I'm like, he's at that age, he, he's 17, 16. He's getting looked at by attention by all the big NRL clubs. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, and he's just starting to drink because, and all his friends are, I'm like, mate, do you, what do you want? Do you want to be? Do you want to drink? Do you want to be an okay footballer, or do you want to be the best footballer? Do you want to be? Do you want to go at the end? If you make it in the NRL, do you want to retire and say, "I fucking give it everything I had"? Not oh, you know, if I laid off the drink, probably I would have been a bit better. If I'd done this, it would have been yeah, a bit living, better. Living with yeah. those regrets in the end is always yeah. So don't live with any regrets. Like, yeah. If you want to do it, fucking do it. Quit yep. drinking. Don't you know? Even disassociate yourself from certain friends that are a bad influence on you. Yep. And if they're your real fucking friends, they won't go. Yeah, they'll, they'll still be there. They'll understand what you're doing and still be yeah. there for you. And it's a, and it's a true fact when you when we talk about um, sportsmen, great sportsmen. We've we've been around those type of people. You've got to live and breathe it. Yes, live it, breathe it, eat yeah. it, shit it. Yep, doesn't matter what it is, but yep. that's what the life you have to do if you want to make it yep. to what your dreams are. Yep. And that, that was me in that, that first three quarters of my fight career until the injuries piled up on me and, and the feeling of homesick and the passion started to dwindle. It wasn't my, 
it wasn't my main passion anymore, you know. I started enjoying life a little bit better because I was older. I was 30, 30 something, you know, I retired when I was 36. Started yeah. when I was 20. But, um, yeah, you, you've got to have that passion. It's got to be your fucking yeah. goal. You've and you've got, got to do it. You've got to do it young too. Because yes. if you're getting to the older stage, 30, 32, the body's not like it nah. used to be. <laughs> not everyone's not that ready. I know. I still train each day. But uh, no, nah, we'll see. We'll still... train tomorrow. We'll see, Richard. No, no, tomorrow. I'm sleeping <laughs> in. Uh, but the, at the end of, end of the day, you know, with everything that you've gone through, the people that you've met, uh, and the experience you've had, at present, what what makes Kyle Nasty Noak, what what's Kyle Nasty Noak's rich life? What really, you know, in your heart, what what mate, you can sit back and you go, that's what makes me happy these days. You know what? Just I like to I like to help people, but I like I like to be a good person, right? Um, it's hard to kind of explain. I, I like to I like knowing. Like I like to be honest, truthful person. I like to just be comfortable in the fact that I'm comfortable being me. And things that don't make me comfortable being me is I you know if I'm doing something that's not right or something that's wrong, you know. Um, even little things like lying, eat me up. Like uh, if I tell a lie, I've got to go, you know what? That's not the fucking truth. I'll, t- I'll tell you the truth. So things like that, like I, at the end of the day, I just want to be comfortable being who I am and that and that's what makes me feel good about being me, I guess, is is being honest to who I am. Yep. Yeah, and that's a yeah, uh, that's a great rich life to be, brother. <laughs> that's a great is, rich life that, to be. That's me. Well, old mate, it's been a uh, absolute pleasure and an honour to sit down with you. We've been we've been friends for a lot of years, a long and time. Uh, but just to get some insights that I didn't know, and just some of the viewers that that might uh, tune in and and see the the Kyle Noak, the pioneer, the nasty Noak. I just appreciate your time, brother, and uh, coming on the Rich Life Projects, no mate. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure. No Thank worries. you, brother. Of course.